modeling is really important for children to see so when you are a child you're kind of spying on your parents nearly the whole time you're watching what they're doing if they yeah. react positively to sitting down to having a really healthy meal you kind of follow suit Hello and welcome to another episode of HSE Talking Health and Wellbeing. My name is Fergal Fox and this episode was initially published in September 2023, but we're sharing it again because it's so timely at this time of year with back to school and the need to support parents in relation to shopping and preparing healthy options for their children. My colleague Eamon Kyo and Marion McBride, dietetic lead in HSE Health and Wellbeing, discussed the importance of a balanced diet and healthy lunch boxes for kids. And we think it's very important to share this episode. Again, it's one of our most popular episodes and we really hope you enjoy it. So let's rejoin Eamon and Marion now. So Marion, it's great to have you here today to talk about this timely topic with schools been back this week. But I just like to talk a little bit about what we mean when we talk about a balanced diet. So Eamon, a balanced diet is one that has a lot of variety and a lot of colour. One of the easy ways to remember it is taste the rainbow. So we look at fruit and veg. Lots of colour on that plate. And then also um, a lot of variety of your breads, rice, pasta, noodles, you know, plenty of that in there as well for plenty of energy. A smattering, let's say, of uh, dairy foods. So yeah. your cheese and your yogurts and milk. And also for your protein foods as well. So your meats, chicken, fish, beans, lentils, plenty of those in there as well. And then There's a little bit of space there for your oils and fats as well, but they're to be kept to limits. So lots of color, lots of variety, lots of change. Okay, And then just to talk about those different elements in a little bit more detail, you mentioned before about the food pyramid. Yeah, so the food pyramid, if we start at the bottom of the food pyramid, the two bottom rungs of the food pyramid are made up of the fruit and veg and also the bread, rice, cereals, pastas. You want those to be the ones that you see most off on the plate. So you're looking at half of your plate to be plenty of fruit and vegetables and plenty of energy foods as well. So, you know, a couple of slices of bread, you know, a fist of pasta or rice on there. And that's really important for the energy point. And then the middle of the pyramid, the two rungs in the middle of the pyramid, we have our dairy foods. So as I say, the cheese, yogurts and milk. And we also have our protein foods and we want to include those during the day. We have certain portions for different food groups or for different age groups, but we want to include those regularly throughout the day. And then for a bit more information on the top two, we're looking at oils such as the oil that you would use for cooking or fats that you might have spread. You have a little bit of space for those as well in the diet. So when we're looking at a balanced diet, we're, we're talking mainly about those five different rungs on the food pyramid. And there is another part, the very, very top of the food pyramid. Yeah, it's kind of removed from the food pyramid. And the reason it's removed is because it's not essential in the diet, but there is a little bit of space in there for your treat foods. So it's important, I suppose, to when we look at a balanced diet and a healthy relationship with food, Mm. that we have a little bit of space for those treat foods as well. For kids, when they are nine years and older, we need to think about including more dairy foods in the diet. So more calcium into the diet. And what that looks like is five portions of dairy foods in the diet every day. And it's important to kind of think about that because when we think about things like cheese and milk and yogurts, we need to be making sure that we have a nice variety. It's not all cheese. So yogurt and milk in there regularly as well. And that's really important for bone development for kids. And they'll be growing quite a lot at that stage. So it's really important. And then the other piece then that is maybe new news for some people is the supplementation requirements. So vitamin D is a supplement that we recommend for children. We're recommending for many of the age groups all through the years, but the amounts change. So for the kind of the take home message for parents is that we're recommending supplementation for children, for those with fairer skin or lighter skin. It's during the winter months. So from Halloween to I'd St. Patrick's Day. Particularly important with absolutely no sun in the sky sometimes. Yeah. So the, the sun is not high enough in yeah. the sky during the winter months, really for it to penetrate through and for us to be able to make the vitamin D that we need from the sunlight. So we need to get it from our diet, but we know that we're not going to just quite get enough from dietary sources. So supplementation is really important. And for children who have darker skin or who maybe cover up their skin for cultural or other reasons, Mm. they then need to look at the supplementation during the summer months as well. So for more information on that, parents can go on to the HSE website. They probably would be able to get good information from their pharmacist as well, because as I said, the amounts change depending on the age of the child. And right. depending on their skin tone as well. Yeah. 
And probably a very obvious question, but why is healthy eating so important for children? Yeah, so I suppose from a from a day to day basis, you're looking to fuel the muscles so that kids can run around, enjoy activities, play with their friends. And then from another point of view, you know, they're in school, so it helps to fuel the brain. So mm. we're looking at keeping them focused, alert, able to concentrate and be able to retain the information that they're learning. But from a longer term point of view, you know, we're we're looking at the physical development of children through those ages. So you're looking at bone growth and immunity as well. It's really important. I think sometimes we forget that it is important to eat a nice balanced diet to be able to protect ourselves from immunity both now and, and in the future. And when we look at sort of cognitive development, there's a huge amount of brain changes through the school years for children. Mm. So being able to fuel that and being able to give children the optimal chance to be able to make the most of that period in their life. Okay, so it's really important, as you say, to eat a well-balanced diet. A well-balanced diet. And I suppose throughout the school years, you're looking at children thinking about the behaviours that they learn at home and at school. Those behaviours are things that you're going to follow through with and continue on into your adult years. So you're really setting down that sort of what is normal for me to do. Mm. Have you any practical tips for parents on how to encourage their children to eat healthier? The one I find works for me is if they see me trying something, they often ask, can I try it? As opposed to me putting it on their plate and saying, will you try this? Will you try that? It's that kind of stealth approach. Yeah. So what you're describing there is modeling and modeling is really important for children to see. So when you are a child, you're kind of spying on your parents nearly the whole time. You're watching what they're doing. If they react positively to sitting down to having a really healthy meal, you kind of follow suit. So that modeling is really, really important. The other, I suppose, some of the parents activities that can be helpful are encouraging a balance and variety. So bringing the family together to sit down to eat, making it kind of family time and trying foods that are different for you and putting yourselves in the shoes of a young child even who's maybe trying foods for the first time, you know. We've all been abroad and presented with a meal that we maybe don't know exactly what's on it. You're trying it. So for a child, they're, you know, they're experiencing that quite often. You know, it's new for them. So they need a little bit of time to learn to trust the food. So the exposure to food is really important. And sometimes for some kids, it can can take up to maybe 20 exposures before they learn that that's a food that they can trust and they can eat. And having the availability of healthy foods at home. So that fruit bowl. Mm plenty of veg they can have on demand maybe if it's possible if there are treat foods in the house to kind of not have them in full view in easy sight so that kids aren't necessarily seeing it and wanting it but they're seeing the healthy foods i think that's really important actually what you were saying there about just leaving it out because i find even with those cherry tomatoes if you leave them on the table and like our house is busy there's people doing sports or the kids are doing sports during the week so it's not always possible to sit down and have a family meal particularly during the week so I think what you were saying there about just leaving food out that they can pick at and at least they're getting the range of food that they should. Yeah and we all know that when we have healthy foods available to us we're more likely to pick them up whereas if you don't then it's more of a track to go and find them so that kind of that environment but also when you have the opportunity to sit with children and to talk to them about what is healthy and teaching them about nutrition, but teaching it to them in a way that actually they're going to take it on board. So kind of linking in with what's important to them. Then the final thing then to I suppose, say about that is about meal planning and yeah. involving children and depending on their age, maybe involving them and preparing foods as well. OK. And can I ask about vegetables? That's always a tricky one. Yeah. Um, well, I suppose vegetables, they're not sweet, so they're not really a preference generally for children. It's not a need preference for them. With vegetables, try small pieces and keep trying. So being patient, but persistent. You could try things like carrot sticks, cherry tomatoes, those types of things, and maybe even put dips alongside them. So maybe hummus or soft cheese, depending on what you've got available and what you think they might try. And then think about maybe trying them raw, maybe trying them roasted, boiled. Sometimes they're more open to having them in a different cooked format. And one of the things that can be useful is to think about, you know, like just before dinner and The kids might be getting a wee bit hungry and they're looking for their dinner and you're thinking, well, it's going to be ready soon. That can sometimes be a chance to just give them some veg that actually maybe you've chopped up during dinner and 
you've got a little bit of you know raw carrot there and just give them that because they're more likely to give it a shot when they're feeling that yeah. wee bit peckish and coming back to that kind of involvement piece it is really important for children to be involved in the preparing and it's not always the easiest thing to be doing but when they're involved in it they feel a part of kind of the making of it they can be you know that little bit more open to then trying it mm. when you sit down to eat and it could be small things couldn't it it's not when you say involvement it's not necessarily standing up at the stove and cooking it with you but it could be go get me those carrots and Absolutely. or will you get the broccoli out of the fridge or whatever it is it's just Absolutely. making them aware of the different food types isn't yeah it? and you know like most kids even from a very young age are very happy to stand at the sink with the water on and, and wash yeah. things you know it might be messy but they're quite happy to do that and it's you know it's safe enough for them to be doing that and then as they get a little bit older it's a really important life skill to learn is to learn how to cook so just even that chopping up veg being aware of you know if you're if you're making chicken or you're making meat just being aware of not having things cross-contaminating and mm. those kind of things are really just very basic life skills but very important and it's something that children can just learn from their environment and even when, I suppose when you're preparing, it gives you the chance to kind of start to teach kids about, you know, we all know those bones, those bones need calcium. We all remember that. So mm. those are very easy things for us to kind of grasp on to. But children might be thinking something like carrots. You could say carrots have a special nutrient that help you to see in the dark and make you run faster, make well, you run faster, whatever, whatever it is, you know, um, that they're interested in. Or maybe you're trying to get them off the sugar sweet beverages and you're saying, you know, if you drink water it'll help to keep your teeth healthy and mm. so you'll have a beautiful smile or whatever and kids kind of grasp on to those types of things so when I say teaching kids about nutrition I'm not talking about going into the in-depth detail of what a nutrient does for the body but you know something that they can kind of grasp on to and they understand that it's important and there's plenty of evidence out there to show that over time when children receive those messages just repeatedly kind of slowly kind of repeatedly over time for six weeks they start to actually consume the food a little bit more because they're aware of it now obviously that's age dependent yeah but yeah it's a really key one and I think as adults we're all aware of that like you might not be super keen on having something in your diet mm. but you consume it because you know it's good for you you go with what makes it kind of tasty for you mm. as well. What I found actually with my kids and now some of them are a bit older, but with the younger ones, it's even just the taste of carrot or peas. I'd say we'll have a few or because I think even and I don't know if this is <laughs> this is my logic, but once they have a taste for it as they get older, at least they'll never say to themselves, oh, I just hate carrots or I don't like peas because they'll have tried it and at least they'll have tasted it and then hopefully will eat more as they grow older. Yeah, so what you're getting at there is that sort of preference. So we're born with an innate preference for sweet foods, salty mm. foods and fatty foods, but you can learn to have a preference for other foods. And it's about exposure, but again, coming back to that trust element, if you trust the food, then mm. you are more likely to try and to consume it. And if it's there regularly then that's that's what you have that's what you have all the time so yeah very good and so obviously all parents are trying their best but with the best will in the world sometimes unhelpful habits can creep in with that in mind what practices have you seen that potentially have a negative effect on children so just looking at the evidence one of the ones is kind of pressure to eat and, and I suppose we've probably all grown up in a home where you're being told to finish your dinner no matter kind of what's in front of you so that's one that I think we can all relate to, but that can sometimes go quite wrong in that the child's not listening to their own signals that tell them that they've had enough to eat. Mm. And so they're using external signals. So it is important for children to use those internal signals. And they're very good at doing that when they're younger. Mm. But again, we can, with the best will in the world, sometimes train them not to listen to those signals. So sometimes it can be difficult to see children leave food on the table leave it on their plate not consume it but try not to pressure kids to eat past the point that they're comfortable with then I suppose the other one is giving children full control so it can be quite difficult to balance that between you know what they like they know what they like and you're trying to put food in the lunchbox that you know that they're going to eat but you're trying to find a balance between what they like and what's kind of a set boundary around what's healthy as well and I don't mean going to a really extreme where you might restrict them on foods because 
they're maybe not the healthiest because that's also not very helpful for the children because that can set them up for that sort of unhealthy relationship with food. So there needs to be a space there where you can include the odd treat. And when I say the odd, I do mean occasional, but at the same time that you're encouraging them to have more of what they like that is healthy and having them consume those. Food can be used as a reward sometimes. Mm. And this can be a difficult one because for most of us, you know, we think a treat, for example, is something that is really nice and it's occasional, but sometimes it can be used as a reward where other rewards could be used easily. Some kids are into stars, other are into, you know, spending time with them, maybe taking them to the playground, mm. maybe taking them to an event or something as a reward rather than it always being food. And that's sort of the other one sometimes that parents can do unknowingly is sort of that emotional regulation. So using food as a means of regulating emotions to get kids to calm down or to get them to stop doing something. So I'll give you a treat if you behave for that type of thing. Yeah. Hour, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that type of thing. And all parents are doing the best that they can and with the best will in the world but it's just to be sometimes just to be mindful of what we're doing that sometimes can be unhelpful and that can sometimes help just to break that habit for parents as well. I mean that's a very interesting point what you said earlier about associating even a positive event with a treat or that if I'm feeling low I eat something sweet or and suddenly my mood gets better so then that potentially carries into later life as well doesn't it? Yes, just kind of coming back to sort of a day to day, you're looking to fuel the muscles, you're Mm. looking to fuel the brain. Food's really an easily accessible commodity. And so sometimes it can be used in, in those ways as well. It's just being aware of it if we are doing it and we've all done it. You know, it's just being aware of it. It can be helpful then just to break that. Can we talk about treats maybe for a little bit? more Mm -hmm. you mentioned them it's good to include a little bit i mean again going back to my own kids within the school actually you can bring one treat on a friday in your lunchbox that's a way of introducing it but i suppose at home as well it's just about restricting the number of treats and being mindful of what they eat yeah so i suppose a a way to think about treats and, and most people do is they think about them as being you know something nice something occasional But what can happen is that the frequency of the occasions can increase. And some of the evidence from the UK and Australia is saying that children can sometimes have onwards from three treats per day. Mm. So a treat in itself is it's certainly it's part of a balanced diet. It's part of having a healthy relationship with food. But at the same time, if the treat is at every meal, then you're starting to kind of accumulate lots of additional sugar fat into the diet and not only that but it's coming back to that innate preference piece so you're building on a child's innate preference for those kind of flavors textures foods Mm. and not giving them the chance to be exposed to the healthier foods so it's a bit of a balancing act but i think it's important that it's not completely restricting them completely out of the diet there is a space for them but again as you're saying it should be small and it should be infrequent and they should be enjoyed when they are having them and not something that's you know three four times a day yeah and also i found as well if you delay it especially with my youngest i find you know not now but i don't come back in an hour or half an hour and sometimes they just forget it's not even they want the treat or they want to eat it's just as you say it's nearly a habit i found that actually during the summer holidays where they're home and they're running around And it's nearly like a habit of I have to eat now or need to snack. And it's interesting that you're saying that because that's part of setting the boundaries around it. Yeah. So that's sort of we have it at this time. It's, you know, this is the time that we're having it. Or it could be that you have certain days maybe that you have treats. But setting boundaries for children around it and then sticking to those boundaries really helps them to kind of grasp that concept of this is something that's you know, it's a treat, it's occasional, it's enjoyable, but it's, it's not part of every meal. And let's talk now about school lunches. I know you've plenty to share about what goes into a school lunch, but can we talk about how to introduce new options? There's a need to do a little bit of legwork, isn't there, before you start introducing new foods? Yeah, so for all parents, you know, generally we want children to look forward to their lunch, and, yeah. you know, open it up and they're excited about it, something that they're genuinely wanting to eat. Maybe one of the first and easy ways is to let the child choose their own lunchbox so they're much happier to open something that they've okayed. And then another piece then is sort of that involvement piece. So encouraging the child's involvement with making 
the school lunch so that they know what's in it. And that also helps to give you the opportunity to have a bit of a discussion or a negotiation maybe around what to swap out. So you might be swapping out maybe crisps for popcorn or mini pretzels or something else that um, just to kind of increase that variety. And as I was kind of saying before about the exposure piece, it's very difficult for children to sit down and have a lunch full of foods that they've never tried before or they're not familiar with. So it's important that if you're going to put putting something in there that you try it out at home and you're fairly sure that they're going to have it. And then if they're part of involving them in making the lunch, they know that it's in there. Mm. And sometimes just even putting in different alternatives as well, you know, changing it up a little bit for kids. So maybe they're not mad on having a sandwich every day. So mm. you might be putting in maybe a cold pasta salad or something like that into the lunch box as well. Or for older kids, they might you know, maybe take a, a soup or a chili or a curry even into the school. So for older kids, they might be interested in trying like having soup or chili or curry, mm. take it in a thermos and it'll keep it warm for them to have at lunchtime. So it's just something different. And again, for younger kids, sometimes a presentation, you know, using a little cocktail stick, if the school allows you <laughs> to have those making little kind of fruit kebabs, those types of things. It can be a lot of hard work at times, but sometimes that's what can work. So again, as you're saying, it's variety and trying different things. And maybe one thing will work this week, mightn't work next week. I mean, what you're saying there, I can hear some parents going, that's great, but they just won't try it or they're not going to change. But as you say, it's just about keeping the faith really and keep going with it. Yeah, I mean, patience and persistence, just coming back again to that repeated exposure message. Yeah. 20 times. That's a lot of times at home. Now, sometimes it can be difficult. You put something out, you've maybe made a big effort mm. to create something fabulous and they're not interested. It's really important just to let it go. Don't fuss. Try it again in a few weeks time and just have that kind of drip feed, drip feed, drip feed with kids. And if they're going to come on to that food, then fine, they'll come on to that food and, you know, they'll have it. And if they don't, well, you know that you've done as much as you can, but keep eating the food as a family, if that's what you normally have as well. Yeah. You yeah. know, and I'm conscious as well. I mean, you know, the cost of living these days and people don't want to waste food. So there is a balance. Yeah, that's when we can kind of think about little amounts as well. It mm. doesn't have to be a full meal. So it can be little amounts and, it, you know, it's just that encouragement and that trying and, and making it fun. Now, in talking about cost of living, we know that it's increasing and the price of food is increasing. But lots of the supermarkets have their own deals. We can be picking up our fruit and veg at more reasonable prices. So it's important to think about snacks that children can pick up easily. So things like easy peelers, bananas, apples, those types of fruit and veg are very easy to pick up and pack into your lunchbox. And then also, you know, things like tin pears, peaches, pineapples, etc. Popping them into a little small box, maybe with some yogurt as well, is easy to prepare the night before and pop into the fridge. Okay. And um, just before we get into what we'll put into that lunchbox, I just wanted to ask you about the more general environment. And since we're talking about school lunches today, can you talk to me a little bit about what the HSE is doing to encourage schools to reinforce health eating? Yeah, so the HSE Health and Wellbeing have developed a free toolkit and training for teachers that guides primary and post-primary schools through the process of developing and implementing and as well of reviewing and improving any existing policies. So this looks at carrying out audits, drafting policy and consulting with parents and, and also implementing the policy. We know that children are there for a long time mm -hmm. every day. Their peers have a huge influence on what they do and what's allowed into the school will impact on that environment. So it's about encouraging parents to support teachers and about teachers looking at the environment from a wider point of view. And it can even be something as simple as you know, making sure that children have the time to sit down to eat their lunch and making sure that they have a nice clean environment um, to eat their lunch in. Those kind of things are really important. So modelling and kind of consistency of what is a healthy environment is important um, because children are there for many years, but they're there for many hours every day as well. So the HSE, as I said, they have the free toolkit. It's a healthy eating policy development toolkit for both primary and post primary. And they also provide the training for teachers as well. And Marion, where can teachers who might be listening find out more information about it? The HSE website. And if you pop in Healthy Eating Policy Development Toolkit, it should pop straight up. Yeah, very good. Yeah, and I do find that kids nearly look in each other's lunch boxes, don't they, to see what my kids have come home. And I mean, that's how my one of mine started eating red peppers because 
she saw one of her friends eating them and she said, can I try that? So yeah, I and was delighted to that's a couldn't very, believe it. <laughs> that's a very positive one. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think as well, you know, it's just about creating that environment where it is normal to try new things and it is normal to have an apple in your lunchbox and to have that as a snack. It's not about cutting everything out, but it is about creating an environment that when parents are doing their best to create a healthy lunchbox at home and when children go out the front door and they're off with their lunchbox and they go into an environment that reinforces all the work that the parents are doing at home, it just makes it a lot easier to continue on with that message because it's consistent. Okay, so we've talked about the introduction of healthy foods and the concept of healthier options going into a lunchbox. I just wanted to talk to you now about what we should actually put in that lunchbox. Mostly it's going to be a sandwich or a cold pasta salad, that type of thing. Yeah. So you're looking at trying to include whole grains where you can, but then also including some protein and some maybe salad or vegetables into that sandwich or into that salad. Then you're looking at having your fruit or vegetables or both and also some dairy foods. So you definitely need to be including cheese or your milk or your yogurt every day in that lunchbox. Now, it is important, as I said before, for nine years onwards, Mm. they need a lot of dairy. So you're looking at five portions. So you might be having maybe milk to drink as well as a yogurt in the lunch as well. Yeah. So it is important to try. And that would be two portions. You're then looking at other points in the day. It might be breakfast or their supper where they're including other dairy foods in as well. There are alternatives out there. And I suppose when we look at the likes of soy milk, for example, many of these milks are fortified with calcium. So they can be really good alternatives for those who can't consume dairy products. Okay. And then in terms of trying to make swaps, crisps is often one that children want to have included in in their Mm. lunch. So Other things like popcorn, mini pretzels, mini rice cakes, crackers, and maybe even, you know, the cheese sticks or the wheels. Yeah. And a nice one, if you have time to do it, is spicy roasted chickpeas. You need to pop them in the oven for a little while and they are lovely, but it is, Mm. you know, it's an extra job for you to do. And then, you know, if they're looking for the likes of cakes or biscuits, that type of thing, maybe try swapping it out for malt loaf or fruited tea cakes or fruit breads and also slices maybe of apple or toast with peanut butter on it as well. It's just something a little bit different for them. Yeah, we just need to be mindful as well about peanut allergies in schools and things like absolutely, that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. No, it's a really good point. And, and I suppose this is another point for the Healthy Eating Policy Toolkit mm. is, you know, that will bring much of that to the fore as well. And if your school's OK with you having it, then great. Most probably won't. But that can be a snack that can be used at home if there's no allergies in the house as well. You know, so having sliced apple with some peanut butter on it is quite a nice little snack. Then things like preparing more salad or vegetables with dinner the night before. So so the work is done. So some of the mm. work is done. You can pop it in your Ziploc bag and leave it in the fridge overnight. And again, as I said before, kind of that involvement for kids as well to involve them in it. And they might be seeing other kids at school have foods that they actually want to try as well. So as you were yeah. saying with your own daughter. So, yeah. Yeah. Actually, when you were saying about involving the kids in the preparation or the choosing of the foods, I was thinking that sounds like more a negotiation with them. It probably sometimes is a little bit more of a negotiation. And I think as well, it gives you a chance to, you know, have a talk around what is healthy. What does that look like? Why would you be wanting to have these foods in your diet? Why would you want to maybe have other foods maybe a little bit less often? So any of those opportunities to kind of have those conversations with kids and keep repeating those messages around teaching them around nutrition is a great opportunity. Okay. And where could parents find out more information about maybe ideas for snack and the things you mentioned there? There's a great campaign called makeastart.ie. has lots of information for parents. There's also safefood.net and there's our own website, HSE website, hints and tips around what parents can do and what they can put into lunchboxes. Okay. This has been so interesting, Marion, but I'm afraid we're coming to the end of the episode. But before we wrap up, can I ask you briefly to summarize maybe in two or three points, any final thoughts for our listeners? Probably the reminder to keep being patient, but keep being persistent. And children do need to learn to trust and accept food. Everything in moderation, we've probably all heard that statement before. And just remember that you're trying to get plenty of the really healthy foods from the bottom of that food pyramid in. But you also need to balance that with developing a healthy relationship with food. 
And then finally, and this is, I suppose, the take home message really is a lot of the work is done at home and it does require a lot of coming back to it, a lot of not getting fussed when children don't want to try something or they spit it out and they tell you it's yuck. Just keep trying. If it is possible to support the school so that when you do all that hard work at home, that when your child goes into the school environment, that that message is reinforced as well. Yeah, yeah. I think, as you said, parents are busy and they're trying their best and to give themselves a break as well, that sometimes one week something will work or something that has worked might not work again. Or But it's just that, as you said, that 20 times that exposure and just keeping it in there, isn't it? Yeah, just keep going. Yeah. Just keep yeah. going. Yeah. Yeah. That's great, Marion. I'd like to thank Marion McBride for joining me today. We appreciate your support for our podcast. And if you like what you heard, we would ask you to share it with at least one other colleague, friend or family member. Please leave us a rating on whatever podcast platform you are listening to or email us at healthandwellbeing.communications at hse.ie if you have any feedback. This has been HSE Talking Health and Wellbeing. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.